Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Today's guest, Kate Kiriaku. By coincidence, I met with Kate at News Queensland's offices in Bowen Hills on the day that her first book was published. It's called The Sting, the undercover operation that caught Daniel Morecambe's killer. And it's a true crime narrative about a case well known to every Queenslander and most Australians, I'd wager given the high-profile nature of the disappearance of 13-year-old Daniel Morecambe in December 2003. Besides writing and publishing The Sting, Kate is chief crime reporter at Queensland newspaper The Courier Mail, where she has worked since 2012, following earlier stints reporting in Mildura and Adelaide. Crime reporting is a tough beat. Day in, day out, these reporters are dealing with some of the nastiest aspects of human nature. Being immersed in this world can take an emotional toll, which is something that Kate and I discuss in this episode. We also explore the concept of writing a whole book about one of those nasty characters. Her experiences as a junior reporter in a regional city where she had daily briefings with local police over tea and breakfast. Kate's early interest in children's literature and young adult novels, which remains an area she'd like to explore in her own writing. Why she prefers colour reporting over straight news writing, and the traits that are required for crime reporters to succeed in this taxing business. Introducing Kate Kiriaku, author and chief crime reporter at the Courier Mail. Thank you. I'm meeting you on a fairly interesting day in your career, Publication Day. Yes. Your, your first book? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so... Tell me about that, that feeling, the emotions that you have right now. It's very nerve-wracking because I think when you write an article for a newspaper, you really do have that newspaper as a sort of backing. And if someone doesn't really agree with what you've written or like what you've written, then they might happily you know, bag out the Courier Mail. But with a book, it's really on your shoulders. So, yeah, I, I'm quite nervous about that because, you know, it, it's a very... It's awful subject matter and there's plenty of potential for people to, you know, be upset by it or not agree with it or anything like that. So, mm. yeah, I, that's that makes me nervous about writing writing the book. But in the end, I had certain goals when, when I was writing that book about... Um, yeah, I suppose how things unfolded um, according to all the people that I spoke to and and who, you know, put in an enormous effort uh, to get the conviction in the end and I, I really wanted to sort of give them a bit of a bit of credit for what they did. Mm. Yeah, and obviously with that, talking about the covert officers who um, I guess by the nature of their job you've got you've got plenty of detectives who are sort of on camera, um, you know, coming in and out of court with with witnesses or holding press conferences, that kind of thing. But but with the covert guys, because of the nature of their work, they can never be identified, and so they're never the people that you see that are associated with the case. So um, they just go about and and start their next assignment, I suppose, after really having to spend day after day with someone who is just an incredible monster. So yeah, I really hoped in writing it that you'd be giving them I'd I'd be sort of telling their side a little bit or painting a picture of what they did mm. the, the book we should say is about the Daniel Merc, uh, Daniel Morecambe murder case and when did you first come across that were you working as a reporter when that first occurred yeah I was but not in Queensland um, I was working where would I have been I would have been in Melbourne when that first happened um, but when I moved to Queensland, I think three and a bit years ago, it it was sort of um, in the about to go through the courts, I guess. So my involvement with it is certainly not the same as a lot of reporters who were around when it happened and, and sort of were there for the whole thing. Um, I came across it for the committal and then um, for the trial. So I covered all of that um, and then started working on the book really at the end of the trial. Were you approached by a publisher to do that? Yeah, so I was approached by a publisher when I was covering the Baden Clay trial, and they initially asked if I could write a book about 
um, the Baden Clay case, but my um, colleague who sits about a metre away from me, David Murray, was in the process of doing just that. So um, I sort of said that's not possible. Someone someone else is already doing that. Um, so I ended a up... A guy who works a metre away from me, yeah. as it turns out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So would have been a little bit... Uh, I don't think he would have been happy with me if I'd done that. Yes. Um, and he did such an amazing job on that. So I ended up writing about the Morecambe case, which is really, really sad. And it was difficult to write about, particularly because... There are so many frustrating elements to it. Um, the police were knocking on Brett Cowan's door two weeks after Daniel disappeared, but they just didn't have the evidence to sort of uh, arrest him then. Um, even, I mean, it, it was very early days when they were knocking on his door, but, you know, the police officers who were there at his door that day were convinced it was him, and they just worked and worked and worked. So that, but they weren't just working on him, they were working on many suspects and many angles and that you know the frustrations around all these sightings of a blue car at at the bridge where Daniel was when he disappeared um they Brett Cowan didn't have a blue car you know there, there was must have been a blue car there but still today nobody knows what they were doing there or who it was or anything mm. like that so that was like a real red herring in that case because they ended up chasing people with blue cars um mm for that reason but in the end it was just irrelevant um yeah. yeah so lots of frustrations and and even when you go back through Brett Cowan's history he's, I mean he's such an he's such an animal um of a man and the some of the offenses he was involved in you know even I think the I think he was 18 or so when he was arrested the first time for a child sex offense and um you just look at the penalties he, he got for those offences and it just doesn't seem right. I mean, he served a year's jail for um, sexually abusing a little boy uh, in a toilet block and then later on he uh, attacked another little boy in a caravan park in Darwin and that child's injuries were just horrific. They were shocked that he survived. That's how bad they were. Mm. And he did three years for that and, and really he should have served a lot more time and he didn't and, you know... At least this time, though, murder in Queensland, it's, it's life imprisonment. So hmm. you, can't, you can't change that. That first approach from the publisher, when did that occur? Like what time period are we looking at between being approached and publication? Oh, so the Baden Clay trial, when did that happen? Uh, it was last year. Um, and I had a six month time, um, deadline so I had to write it in six months so that was you know a few weeks for sort of talking back and forth and then and then that six month period so um, my deadline for the book was around oh not good on dates maybe April or May mm -hmm. um, and then publication obviously now so six months uh, to write a book is quite a, sh a small window um, and it's a lot of work. It's a huge amount of work. And I took a lot of time off of work to get it done. And so much of that was pouring through court documents and transcripts and things like that. I mean, even the transcript from the inquest was like thousands of pages. So mm. it's um, it's a big sort of project to pull together. And then you find yourself writing a piece which is essentially 100,000 words long. And just doing it in a Word document, you really get lost in that and you can't remember if you've included something and even just searching back, trying to work out whether you've put it in, you know, lots of control F searches, mm -hmm. looking at keywords to work out whether you've mentioned something or not. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a big job and you really do, you do get lost in it. Even when you have a plan, a chapter plan at the start, to sort of, oh, I'm going to talk about this in chapter one and this in chapter two. I mean, you barely stick to that in the end because sort of becomes its own beast as you start writing and takes yeah. on its own form and um but yeah it, it it's it's a big job and it's a lot of work to do in six months yeah did yeah. you put that outline together yourself did you do that with the assistance of an editor or no i put it together myself um my publisher uh five mile press they are really good to work with they're sort of a smallish publishing company based in melbourne and um they were quite relaxed um, about everything. So I sent them my chapter plan and they said it looks great. And so I started writing and, um, yeah, it was really up to me how I wrote it and how it came together. And then I sent it to them, my first draft. And um, 
that I have a look over it and get what back to me. What was that moment like, sending the first draft? Oh. Were you sure it was good or were you full of doubt? No, I'm never, sh- I'm never sure anything's good. I'm pretty much like that every time I send any piece of work through. and oh, So many times I, I look at it and I think, oh, I'm so embarrassed to be sending this through. This is ridiculous. Like, you know, they're going to come back and say, um, what have you done? But um, then the next day I'll read it and I think, that's not so bad. What was I worried about? Um hmm. But, uh, what, do you, what do you think that impulse is? Is that just um, being so lost in the work that you've lost the ability to distinguish what's good and what's not? Yeah, or, I think that's exactly Because I, I find the same thing myself. Yeah. Like you spend enough time, whether it's in a feature or book chapters or whatever, it just becomes nonsense to you in a sense. And you, yeah. you need that external perspective to look at it. Yeah, and sometimes you just need a bit of a breather from it too and come back and look at it the next day. But. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the world of daily newspapers, you don't get that opportunity. So mm. I think that's when you come back and read it the next day when it's in the paper and you think, oh, what was I worried about? But mm. yes, yeah, certainly with the manuscript, um, that was on a larger scale of that with the, you know, that I have with the newspaper. Um, yeah, I was really nervous. I thought they'd send it back and say, you yeah, this needs a lot of work or, you know, I've got a very distinct writing style and it's not overly, you know, structurally correct or... You know, I, d- I don't sort of work to the rules of how to write a newspaper article mm. or anything like that. I sort of really go by what kind of flows in a certain way and what puts you in a certain mood and what um, puts you in a certain place. Um, yeah, I really like to sort of set a scene when I'm writing something and um, bring the reader in and make them feel like they were there looking at the things that I was looking at. So sometimes because of that, because you're not fitting to, you know, the rules of how things should be written, um, yeah, I wonder whether it's worked at all. But, yeah, generally I think instinctively, you know, as a writer you tend to sort of in your head get it right a little bit um, because really you're just trying to tell a story. So but with the book it was that on a bigger scale because no one told, you know, they didn't tell me how to write a book or what they were expecting they just said go for it Mm. um but the feedback was really good uh they really liked the style i'd written it in and i I was kind of expecting them to come back with a thousand things that they wanted me to rewrite and redo but they they didn't at all um Mm. and then they sent it off to a proofreader and an editor that kind of thing and they go through it and i was really amazed with how thorough they were over a hundred thousand words just picking up things like you know was it this was it such and such street or such and such road did you get that right and they've Mm. gone back and looked at a map or i know there was one bit in there where i mentioned that the state government had increased um the reward for information um leading to you know daniel's murder or whatever had happened to him um, the reward had been increased and I just had that was just one line in my book at a certain point of the storyline you know and they came back to me and said oh actually the state government didn't increase that reward that was private um, sort of uh, businessmen who donated extra to fund that and I'd written the state government increased the reward because that's what had been published by the Courier Mail in an article but it wasn't correct and they'd they'd not only seen that article, they'd gone back and researched further, which I clearly should have done, um, just to make sure that that was correct. And yeah, I I was quite stunned that they were so thorough with every little point um, just to make sure it was all accurate. That's what you want, right? Mm, It was great. It was really impressive. Yeah. You mentioned earlier it's a, a pretty dark topic to be immersed in for any period of time, like myself personally, seeing news items on the Morecambe case over the years, it's, it's abhorrent what happened to him and to spend any time thinking about it is to look into some pretty dark places. What was it like for you to be immersed heavily in that world for not just writing the book but for years with your career mail reporting as well? Yeah. Um it was really heavy going and I guess because I've been writing crime for you know more than a decade now um, generally you're um, generally I'm okay with things Um, it's horrible and you always feel sad but um, it's your job and you have to do it but there are also times when things get on top of you a little bit and you just hear something and it doesn't even have to be anything overly horrific it's just usually little details where you think okay I've had enough today and I do remember there was one day um, during the committal where it was the first time um, we got some sort of indication of 
uh, the confession Brett Cowan had given to the covert operatives and it's where he talks about luring him into the abandoned building and um, he said I, I grabbed him and pulled down his pants and he yelled oh no and tried to run away and I've grabbed him around the neck and pulled backwards and heard a clicking noise and I broke his neck and I accidentally killed him and I think over the years people had come up with a lot of theories about what could have possibly happened to Daniel including his mum and dad they had all the most horrible thoughts in the world and some of those thoughts were was he held captive for you know a length of time and um, before he was killed I guess on the scale of things you know that that was a scenario where he might have suffered less than he could have in other scenarios but because it was Brett Cowan saying it and he was the one who knew it was just the most horrible thing in the world and I remember we'd sort of been talking and, and laughing with Bruce and Denise in the foyer of the court before we went in for that hearing mm. and Daniel's parents Daniel's parents yeah and um, then we just heard this horrible stuff and I'd, I'd sort of remembered filing it for our website which we sort of have live rolling coverage when it's a really big court case so you might file three or four sentences send them through the next three or four send them through so you're really running on adrenaline during those big cases and I remember thinking oh my god this is you know awful but at the same time no one really knew what happened to Daniel until now so this is really important information that we're hearing so I had that sense of that and I was filing and filing and filing and filing and then I got back to the office completely running on adrenaline and they said we want the front page and then a double page spread inside so I had a really limited time to write that up so I'm writing it and writing it writing it I sent it through and then as soon as I'd hit the send button I walked up to the chief of staff desk and I said oh look um, you, I've, I've given you the copy it's done have a look at it see what you think um, but I'm going to go home in a couple of minutes it's been a long day and I, and I remember just as I said that that's when I realised I was really I'd I just had enough I couldn't even read it back to see if it was okay I just didn't even want to look at it anymore and mm. they sort of really got the sense of that because I don't generally you know I generally do my job and they don't they expect me to be able to handle it pretty well and it's not that I wasn't handling it but they could see that I'd had enough so they said just go home we'll call you if you need to yeah. if we need to call you and yeah I could not have written one more word that day it was just I just didn't want to think about it anymore I had to go home and so I've gotten in my car and I drove out of the driveway of work and I got about 100 metres down the road and bang, someone crashed into me and um, yeah, did substantial damage to my car and I remember getting out of the car in the rain and it was cold and it was night and the front mm. of my car was all ruined and the guy, luckily it was a, a very apologetic guy and his girlfriend in, the, in his ute, mm. you know, they held an umbrella over me as they took, we exchanged details and stuff like that but I just remember thinking, I don't think this day could get any worse but... In saying that, you always think, well, it was probably a thousand times worse for Daniel's parents. So mm. you always feel, you know, if something upsets you or you find something difficult, you, I always feel like you've got no right to feel like that. You know, it's it's not you that it's it's not you who's suffering through this. But mm. yeah, there are certainly times when you do this job where you think, okay, I've had enough today. I need to just go home and and clear my head. What was your relationship like with? Bruce and Denise? Um, they knew a lot of journalists for a very long time before I arrived on the scene and um, I think with me writing this book uh, it was difficult for them because it's essentially a book about the man who killed their son and they are very wary of any publicity that he gets at all so like I sort of explained to them what I was doing and they obviously had written their own book about their story so They've been really good about it. Um, I didn't want to involve them in my book because um, I didn't want to have to put them through it. And I didn't need to, so I didn't want to. And, you know, how many times do they need to sit down with a journalist and go through things again and again and again? And really, they've done so in, in the inquest on the stand and in the trial on the stand and through a thousand press conferences. So it was kind of, for me, I didn't, I didn't want to put them through that again and in the end it was about it was about the covert operatives and this insane um covert scenario that they did where they basically pretended to be a criminal gang so it was really a focus on that um and obviously on their uh targets so mm. yeah for Bruce and Denise I sort of 
kept them informed of what I was doing, but I I didn't really want to have to get them to go through things over and over with me. Did you read that book that came out was it a year or two ago about their their story? Yeah, where is Daniel? Them? Yeah, yes, um, yes. I did. Yeah, um, it's a very uh, a very sad sad book, I think, but. Uh, there's a lot in it about their founda- foundation and, and what they did. Um, I mean, it's an amazing thing that they've done. They've they've lost their son to a predator and they've dedicated their life to making sure nobody else has to go through what they went through. And they've dedicated their lives to protecting children, other children, from people like him. And he's in jail, but he's not the only person out there like that. And I think the, if the inquest showed anything, it showed just how many people there are walking amongst us every day that are quite capable of doing, you know, something similar or, mm. um, yeah. How did you go about securing access to the covert operatives involved in this thing? Oh, so um, I didn't so much have access to them. I had access to a lot of material that was presented to the court which sort of, I guess, um, showed how things unfolded. Um, I was able to interview one of the covert officers um, a few weeks back. I'd, I'd requested to do that at various times and Queensland Police uh, in fact, I don't think they would have ever let anyone interview a covert officer. Um, it's so secret what they do, but um, they changed their minds quite recently. Um, I'm not sure why, but uh, that's fine. I'm happy to speak to their covert person, um, no matter what the reason. So. Mm. Uh, I think for them it was time for him to get a bit of recognition for what he did. So the person I spoke to was Joe. Um, I have no idea what his real name is, but that Joe Emery was the name he used during that covert operation. So we sort of decided that when I met him, we'd still call him Joe. made sense. Um, So it was really fascinating to speak to him. He um, is the person who caught the plane from... Brisbane to Perth with sitting next to Brett Cowan. So how they worked it out was uh, Brett Cowan had appeared at the inquest. Uh, He'd given evidence. It was a very um, difficult day for Brett on the stand. I suppose he just told them later about it and he said, my hands were sweating. He really had like, you know, quite a few different lawyers who were representing different people. One that was representing the QPS, one who was representing the coroner, one who was representing um, Bruce and Denise Morecambe. And he got grilled and grilled and grilled. And they basically said, I remember one of the things that was said um, to him by one of the lawyers, which was really incredible. Um, They said, you know, you, a person with your background who can take a child in a matter of minutes and abuse them and then just dump them again. You've driven past a boy standing by the side of the road by himself. He's just missed the bus. He's stranded there you know, suggesting that you could just drive on by without doing anything is like suggesting a a snake could pass by a a mouse without giving it a second glance. It Mm -hmm. just would not have happened. And um, so he's coming out of that, that sort of stressful situation for him, getting on a plane to go back home. And then there's some nice, friendly guy having a chat next to him on the plane for five and a half hours. So Joe was really interesting. He, He He's this terrible terrible crime that's been committed nothing they've been able to do up until this point has worked to try and get them some sort of evidence to um point them in in the direction of any one suspect that would be enough to you know lay charges so that it's a as the deputy commissioner described it to me it was their last roll of the dice this was their last go um they were willing to um, put a covert officer on him to try and befriend him Uh, if that didn't work he was not a person who was easily accessible for a covert operative. He mm-hmm. lived in a caravan. He really didn't have any sort of social, um, ongoing social commitments. Um, he just, you know, lived in a caravan park. He barely worked. They couldn't put someone at his workplace. It would have been difficult. So this is it. They've got someone on a plane with him for five and a half hours. He's got that amount of time to make friends with Brett Cowan. And that was it. That's what he had. So... Um, Yeah, he was a really interesting person to to speak to in regards to that. And he said, I was surprised at the end of it that um, 
he gave me his phone number and was really excited about meeting up and looking for a second-hand car with him and that kind of thing. Mm. Which is one of the goals, right, to maintain contact or to yeah. establish contact and to maintain it yep. to befriend him. Yeah, and the best way to do that, they thought, was because Brett liked tinkering with old cars. They thought that they could get Joe to buy an old car and then they could work on it together. So, I mean, that's obviously a bit of a pipe dream. Hopefully that happens. And it really did. Mm. And I think it worked well because Brett is not the kind of person that really anyone wants to talk to. He is a narcissist. He big notes himself all the time. He never shuts up. He just talks and talks and talks all about himself. He's got no interest in asking anyone else about themselves. Mm. And he's just weird. He says all sorts of weird things and really inappropriate things and really quite sadistic things. And I can't imagine there was a lot of people in his life who were okay with putting up with that. And he also was told during a... um, sex offender program uh, he's really impressionable so he did a sex offenders program in prison and they basically said to him you should disclose your history to people and so he, like it almost seemed like he was just going around telling everyone that he was a child sex offender mm. and um, so obviously not everyone wants to keep in contact with someone once they've told them that they are a child sex offender you know mm. um, yeah, so um, he hung out with Joe for a while and uh, it was only after the that sort of um, plan got underway that it was suggested to someone on that team that they should try this Mr Big scenario. And that is, yeah, that was really incredible. So it was developed in Canada and they've been using it for about 100 years over there. Wow. Yeah, except, you know, over the years it sort of morphed and developed into this really complex thing. I think earlier on it was um, a lot more simple. Could um, you explain what the Mr Big scenario is? Yeah, yeah. So essentially the Mr Big scenario is where they pose as a, police will pose as, you know, criminals, a criminal gang. And um, they... It only works on, you know, a certain type of person, I guess. Um, impressionable people who are in need of money. Um, yeah, my understanding is I've tried it on a truck driver um, somewhere else in Australia, and um, he didn't need money through little odd jobs of the crime gang, so it just didn't work. So essentially, they they lure you into this world where. Um, you're doing jobs for this criminal gang and it might be maybe you just do a bit of surveillance um his first job with them was come to the airport um we need you to tell us if this man gets off a plane basically and they showed him a picture of somebody Mm. and then so he did that and he didn't see the guy um but they said that they had people waiting at different exits and he was at one of the exits so they rang him after a little while and said don't worry we spotted him thanks for your help here's a hundred dollars or whatever thanks for your help you know, thanks for your good work. Mm. And to Brett Cowan, that's a hundred bucks for doing nothing. So he he was quite stoked to continue on that. And gradually, he, he became more and more aware of what this group was about and what they were capable of. And, and to him, they uh, were this very powerful organisation that were very smart about how they operated. They didn't, you know, they weren't interested in violence or um, any sort of... They would sort of pay out the bikies a bit because bikies are always getting themselves in the news and into trouble with the police and it draws attention, it's unwanted attention. They don't operate like that. They're professional. Mm. It's a business, nothing more. So um, he was doing things like helping them smuggle diamonds interstate. Um, He was going with them to brothels to do cash pickups for protection money. Um... Even like a fruit and veg market, they were getting protection money off those guys. Restaurants, everything, they were picking up crayfish loads and taking them elsewhere. And And it's all about building a sense of um, self-worth and self-esteem in in the mark to um, make them feel wanted and appreciated by this group. Yep, and it was all about uh, the brotherhood as well. So he felt like he was part of this brotherhood of guys who worked together. They were all brothers. They would go out to fancy lunches together, They, you know, they were mates, they looked out for each other, there was this real sense of loyalty. So they they had to, like every day, they had to um, reinforce their objectives, so that's trust, honesty, loyalty. Um, we have to trust each other, you have to be loyal to us, you have to be honest with us all the time, honest about everything. We don't care who you are, we don't care where you've come from, we've all got a history, we've all got a background, um, none of that matters to us. All that matters is that you're going to do the right thing by us and, and you're going to be one of us. And Brett had never been involved in anything like that before in his life. He'd never felt wanted. Uh, he'd never felt 
um, liked or um, respected, never. So that was, um, he became really engrossed in this world and almost obsessed with it. He was saying stuff to them like, oh, this is the stuff dreams are made of. I always knew there was something out there for um, people like me, but I never knew what it was. And um, so in the end, they, they get to the point where he's been making some really good money with them doing all these jobs. They had him doing surveillance at, a, at an air, airport, a small airstrip, where they said they were going to bring in a big shipment of ecstasy. And um, everyone involved in that job was going to get 100 grand. And that's more money than he's ever had in his life. So he, by the time this job was almost underway, he'd spent that money in his head, if not, you know, physically, because he didn't have it yet. But um, he uh, had picked out a car that he wanted to buy, picked out a jet ski, you know, that covert operatives were going shopping with him all the time. Um, He was really excited about getting this big payout. And then just when he was so obsessed and so entrenched in this world, they threatened to take it away. So what they did is they said, we've got dirty cops on our books who feed us information all the time just to make sure we stay out of trouble. And um, we hear that you are, you know, the number one suspect in the Daniel Morecambe investigation. We understand you're going to get called back to the inquest. Um... When you're there, you're probably going to get arrested at the end of it. Um, they know that your alibi is shit, so um, you know you're you're likely to get arrested. So they said um, we can help you, uh, but you have to tell us what you've done. So we need to make sure there's no evidence that the cops are going to find because if that starts, then they're going to start looking into us, and that's going to bring heat on our group, and we can't have that. So if the heat's on you, the heat's on us. So you need to tell us what you've done. And initially he said, no, I didn't do anything. And they said, we know you have. You know, we've got good information from our cop mates. They tell us you've done it. They tell us dead set, you've done it. So you've got to tell us. If you don't tell us, you're out. So he was left in this situation where this new life that he was so obsessed with was about to be taken away unless he confessed to the crime. And so he did confess. And he took them to where um, where he'd left Daniel's body. And, of course, they had that... Um, really enormous search of that area with a lot of people involved um, doing a lot of um, hard work on their knees in the mud scratching around in the dirt and yeah they found they found his body which this this story well these couple of stories were extracted in the Korean Mail and the Sunday Mail in the last couple of days which I've read having not read the book obviously it just came out today but yeah the the amount of detail that you've um, put into constructing those scenes is remarkable it really feels like I, as the reader, was immersed there and saw right there with the operatives as they were talking to Cowan and he was leading towards the, the spot where it took place. So yeah. Based on you. those couple of extracts, credit to you for <laughs> thank you. doing that. Yeah, and I really hope it shows exactly what it was like for those guys who worked so hard on it, yeah, to, to you know, bring a little boy home to his parents. And, I mean, really, to them, they just had to keep doing their job and... Um, they had to, uh, you know, immerse themselves in, in his world and laugh along when he made the most horrific of jokes and thought he was a bit of a legend and they just had to play along with it. So That's a tough job. Yeah. and A taxing job. A taxing job. And it's not like, you know, um, you can do what we do here and just have a bit of a debrief with your mates at the end of the night. Um, they can't do that. They can't talk about what they're doing with anyone but, you know, the people who are working on the operation with them. So mm. it's even more difficult in that sense. Uh, I mean, Joe was a long way from home. He was over the other side of the country. Um, yeah, it was just difficult um, for all of them to just be immersed in that world. How much time did you spend with Joe in those interviews for the book? Uh, well, I interviewed him and ended up writing it up for the paper because that sort of happened after I'd finished the book. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's a unfortunate. I yeah, suppose. yeah, it was. But um, I probably only spent about an hour and a half with him. Mm. But I'd read so much about him. So I think that's why I found it so interesting to speak to him because I had a picture in my head um, of what he would be like um, after reading so much of the material that came out. Um, and just hearing things through other people as well, contacts. So, um, yeah, he was a very interesting guy to speak to. But, yeah, you can sort of see that um, it's a difficult job that they do. There's that detail in the story about the plane trip from Brisbane to Perth where 
was it a few days or weeks after that plane trip, Joe had uh, recurring pain from uh, leaning away from Brett in his seat instinctively. So I'd heard that through other people and then he told me the same thing in that interview. Yeah, he said it was for a few days after that plane trip. He... He, yeah, he had pain in his hip and it took him a little while to realise that he was pressing against the sort of edge of the seat that was furthest from Cowan because I guess um, underneath it all, even though he was leaning in to talk to him, uh, to be friendly to him and to make friends, you know, another part of his brain was just completely repulsed by him. So he was, mm. his body was trying to push him away from Brett. Mm. Just um, finishing up on the book, in terms of storyboarding or plotting out the arc, of the book was it a simple structure like did you go from the first uh i guess the disappearance to the capture of cowan or up to the trial like how did you sketch that out yeah it sort of was just a bit of a timeline initially but um it turned out a little bit different in the book but i i did sort of plan it one way and then as you were writing it it sort of just formed its own narrative Mm. um But it was, generally speaking, a bit of a timeline of events. But I do start off, I really wanted to start off with something that happened in the covert operation. So the first chapter is um, Fitzy, who's one of the main covert operatives who made friends with Brett. He's from Perth. He's a Perth officer. Mm. And it's the two of them driving to do a job, an overnight job. They're supposed to be going to Kalgoorlie to, I think it was a cash pickup or something like that. And they they get about an hour out of Perth on the road and um, they get a phone call from the sort of state boss of this crime group saying, um, Arnold's in town, Um, he wants to see Brett. And Arnold is the big boss and they'd always spoken about him um, with a lot of reverence when they did say, oh, the big boss, I can't believe he's even in town or, you know, what's he doing here? So just to make a point with with Brett that he was very important Mm. and, you know, commanded a lot of respect. And so they they get this call saying the big boss wants to meet Brett and Fitz is saying to him, oh, don't be nervous, mate, don't be nervous. He probably just wants to see you about this big job that we've got coming up, the $100,000 each um, ecstasy hall so they've turned the car around they drive to you know a hotel where he's booked out a a bit of a suite of rooms and they go in there and sit down and and Arnold basically it's the moment he puts it to him you know I've been speaking to my people they tell me you're good for this murder Um, I need to know what's going on so all of that whole operation was aimed at um, uh, well, they, they spent a lot of time reinforcing the hierarchy of the group. So Brett was on the bottom, Arnold was on the top. Mm. And um, when, when you meet the big boss, it's, it's a very big deal. So they wanted him to have that in his head when, they, when the big boss, um, and that's why they call the operation Mr Big, because it's all aimed at putting the target before this Mr Big. Um, and Mr Big is the one who extracts a confession. Mm. And hopefully the person is so, you know... Um, overawed, by. overawed by by this person who's you know asking them for trust and loyalty and respect in order to stay in this group um, that they will give them what they need. Mm. And then that arc. So that's the first scene. That's a, a compelling hook, and it's, yes. that it's one of the scenes that was extracted in the last couple of days in the newspaper. Is that correct? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. So that's that's written about at the start, and then it's written about just as the storyline continues. So mm-hmm. when I go back to it again towards the end of the book, that's what appeared in the paper. That version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the initial chapter. That's to sort of get people, give people an idea of this covert operation, how it was unfolding. And then, um, then I start from the start, and we talk about um, Daniel and, and Bruce and Denise, his family, his upbringing a little bit, mm. um, and then um, his disappearance. And then from there, I start talking about Brett and his upbringing and his life, and um, his earlier offences, the other children he'd abused, and I really try and make a point with with Brett that. He came from a very good family. He had very nice parents. Um, he's got brothers who have been successful and um, uh, have their own families now. Uh, and Brett, uh, there's no reason for him to be the way he is. Mm. He wasn't abused as a child as far as anybody knows, and he's always denied that. 
Um, so I wanted people to know that he didn't have this horrible upbringing that has made him the way that he is. His family were loving and supportive and tried to stand... His parents especially tried to stand by him even after his first couple of offences because, you know, to them he was their son and if they helped him then maybe they could make him a better person. But I think in the end he's just who he is. Mm. What you mentioned earlier about Bruce and Denise and not wanting to give publicity to their son's murderer was that was that a tension for you at any point during the process like you were writing this in-depth book about how they caught this man who has done this horrible thing was that something that you gave much thought to yeah I always give a lot of thought to all of those things um and I suppose it's difficult because on the one hand you are giving someone publicity and you're making them you know a little bit notorious for what they've done but on the other hand there were also really important reasons why I wanted to write certain things about him and some of those reasons were you know one that I just mentioned he's not a product of his upbringing um, and I think that's only fair for his family for that for people to know that Mm. and the second one was he was given uh, a couple of jail terms for um, abducting and uh, sexually abusing two young boys and I think there wouldn't be many people who wouldn't be disgusted with how light those sentences were particularly the um, Darwin boy he served three years um, for kidnapping a little boy from a caravan park he picked him up and he walked him out into the bush and he um, sexually abused him Um, there are a lot of sort of accusations made um, through that court process where essentially detectives believe he was raped with a tree branch and his injuries were really really horrific like horrific and in fact those photos of that boy's injuries were shown to the team of detectives just right before they arrested Brett Cowan so that they would understand what he's capable of So this little boy had probably injuries to pretty much every centimetre of his body and there were what appeared to be whip marks all over his body. Um, There were blood blisters all over his face from where they think he was strangled until he passed out. Um, Horrific injuries, really horrific injuries. And he did three years jail for that. And, I mean, in my opinion, uh, I believe they initially charged him with attempted murder and that attempted murder charge was dropped and he went for sort of lesser offences in the end that was attempted murder that kid nearly died you know and that were the police who were involved in that arrest were shocked that he survived considering the state he was in when they sent him to hospital and um yeah I spoke to the coppers who were involved in that job and and who worked out that it was him and who spoke to the boy and all of that kind of thing and mm. they don't forget that sort of stuff and they they remember you know the state he was in and what Brett was like and you know that that just wasn't enough time and I sort of hope that everyone who reads my book reads that what happened to that to that boy and and agrees with that and and finds it disgusting mm. were there any pieces of puzzle of that murder case which you couldn't find which were like tantalizing out of reach the entire Oh, I think that's just, um, uh, I would have loved to have spoken to the WA covert officers. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I had a lot of material, um, that looked into exactly what they'd done and what they'd said to each other, that kind of thing. So that was great. So I can really paint a picture of how things unfolded with the covert operation, but, um, Definitely I would have loved to have spoken to Fitzy because he spent so much time with Brett. Mm. Um, it would have been really interesting to get his perspective on things. But, um, you know, as a crime reporter, every time you do something like this, you you have um, a bit of a dream about who you would love to speak to. And, um, yeah, certainly um, that's why you have contacts as a, as a reporter so that you can get some background information from people who might trust you to tell you those sorts of things but I guess um yeah with WA police I put in the request to speak to their covert officers and you know understandably they they didn't want to give me access to them so that's that's generally how it works and like I said before 
when Queensland Police let me speak to Joe, I was, you know, quite surprised by that mm. because I, I can't imagine they would they would have ever done that before. And in fact, when when I met with Joe and and his boss, um, they were quite they weren't quite sure how it was going to work um, because they'd never dealt with the media before. So. It was you and Joe, and who else in that interview? Was there uh, a, so an Joe's, advisor or something? Yeah, like a media advisor, and also the head of the covert unit sat in. Um, they didn't even want my photographer to stay in the room, mm. so they were uh, a little bit wary of um, how many people would be in the room when Joe was talking. And um, mm. I think that's that was to make him feel a bit more comfortable. And he wasn't the type of person who sort of seeks publicity. Um, QPS more than anything wanted him to have publicity because they felt he should get some recognition for his role in in the job mm. but he's not the type of person who seeks it out yeah mm. how do you handle yourself in those situations where it's not just you and a source it's advisors who may be interfering with what's being said yeah so they um yeah that happens every now and then mostly for the important sort of interviews but um yeah, I guess you have to treat each interview on what it is. So if I'm meeting a source and having a chat, that's a completely different situation to when you're in an, an approved interview where you're being looked after by a media advisor. They don't ever... Um, generally, I will talk to the media advisor about what sort of things are okay to talk about and what sort of things they wouldn't be comfortable talking about. And it's a different situation in my job it's not like I'm trying to grill a politician on things that they might want to keep to themselves. When they put those sorts of um, provisions in place is to protect the work that they do and to not impact on further investigations or not impact on that investigation. So you really have to respect that. So you sort of set up guidelines um, going into it and then I know what I can and can't ask and I, I don't know that I've ever been stopped in one of those interviews um, by the media advisor saying no you can't ask that um, because I try and get a really clear picture before I go into it um, and he was happy to answer any of the questions I put to him and he was really thoughtful about all of them too um, there was this one tiny thing that he said um, that his boss clarified but that's um, wasn't so much that he said the wrong thing it's more like can I just clarify that so that people don't interpret it this way instead of this way and I was you know I was like oh yeah fair enough I didn't think about that but mm. really other than that they're, they're usually pretty good um, because it's all been discussed before you go into it. Do they go as far as uh, asking to check quotes or facts beforehand and do you have a, a response to that? Yeah um, sometimes they do want to sort of get a bit of a, an idea of how it's going to come together and um, with an interview like that where it's really sensitive and you're really having to protect someone's identity and protect their methodology I don't mind um, but other than that in all other circumstances you know you wouldn't say yes to that because it's just fraught with danger that sort of thing you know you don't want people trying to control how you're portraying a story and you don't um, you can't even guarantee, you know, I might give them my first draft, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to get changed by sub-editors or, mm. you know, anyone else who wants to get their fingers on your copy. So it doesn't mean that looking at all at the finished product, it's just what you're providing to your bosses. And once it goes to them, you know, it's really difficult for me to be able to show anyone what, you know, even myself, I don't know how it looks a lot of the time, you know, once it leaves my hands. And you probably have to explain on a semi-regular basis that you don't write the headlines, you don't control the images that are used. All the you time. Just, you just do the text. Yeah, all the time. And that's um, that's sort of been an issue in the past too when, you know, a reporter might write a story a particular way and the headline's quite dramatic and then the reporter gets blamed for it and, you know, there's even a change.org petition about a couple of the young reporters here over a story um, calling for them to be sacked because of a headline and they didn't write the headline and in fact it was very it was very upsetting for them to um, have to go through that on you know because because of something that was completely out of their hands yeah yeah in your line of work crime reporting um, how often do you come up against the tension between objectivity in your reporting and advocacy journalism and by that I mean what you were saying earlier about how you hope that if people read the sting, they'll be 
appalled by the sentencing that was given to Cowan. Like that's that's uh, your opinion, and you're you're a reporter. You deal with facts, but you also mm-hmm. want to um, make readers think about sentencing laws. How do you deal with that tension? Yeah. So um, I think as a crime writer, more than other areas, it's really easy to have that that objectivity. Um, particularly when you're covering a, a court case. I mean, in a court case, you have to be balanced and fair and just provide a, a description of how things unfolded in the courtroom. So you present both both sides, you know, the defence and the prosecution. That's it. That's completely objective. Um, you're just reviewing what's happened during the day uh, in a courtroom. Before it gets to court, when you're, when you're out on the road, um, once again your opinion might be that it's horrific that this person's been murdered but of course it is everyone's going to agree with that so that you can put that into your writing how horrific this person's death is how tragic it is how needless it is um that's just obviously you know that's what it is so outside of that um i guess in in the as a crime writer it can be quite black and white um what's happened so you're either objective because you're presenting the facts or you're detailing a horrific crime. Once someone's charged, you've got to lose a bit of that because otherwise you you can impact on a on a future trial. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's generally pretty easy in crime. I think in other areas it'd be a lot more difficult. Mm. Yeah. Let's rewind a bit. Where did you grow up? Oh, okay. So I grew up in Adelaide. Um, uh, I grew up on a in a beachside suburb uh, in Adelaide, which is very pretty. Um, I went to school at Woodville High School, which was a public school. I had a year twelve teacher who laughed when I said I wanted to become a journalist, and I was always really confused by that because English was my favourite subject, and I always got really good marks in it, and um, I was so offended. Why did they laugh? Oh, she was, I don't know, maybe she was laughing because it's one of those things like, you know, um, a difficult uh, industry to get into and so many people want to do it. it. It wasn't like, it wasn't a nice laugh, it was a, you know, good good luck to you kind of laugh and I just remember being really offended and I thought, why would you even say that to me? Why would you do that? You know, why, why, why wouldn't you be encouraging? And I've always been quite a stubborn person that just made me want to do it more and then um, so I studied professional writing at UniSA and um, on our first day they said you know of the 500 um, people who graduate from journalism and writing degrees in three years time you know maybe six of you will get jobs in the industry so we would recommend you switch out of this and go into teaching or something like that. And I remember there were two girls I was standing with that I knew from, you know, either high school or whatever. Um, They just said, yeah, I'm going to go into teaching. I'll see you later. And I just remember thinking, well, I'm just going to be one of those six people. So (laughs) I'll catch you later. (laughs) And um, so when I finished my degree... um, Were you a good student? Sorry? Were you a good student? Um, Was I a good student? I think so, yeah, but I was also a very laid-back student. Um, Yeah, I I enjoyed uni. There were several subjects I enjoyed more than others. Some of them I kind of thought were a bit of a waste of time, but there were other ones that I really loved. Like I did a subject on um, short story writing. That was great, you know, things like that. Computing, not so much. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I guess... I'm, you know, I'm getting a bit old now, so computers were still things that they felt they needed to teach people back then, whereas nowadays a five-year-old could tell you everything there is to know about a computer. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I was pretty good on them, so I just thought it was a bit of a waste of time to spend six months of my life learning how to use a Word document, you know. Um, So, yeah, after uni, uh, I just opened up the newspaper and looked at journalism jobs which there were almost zero of what year was this it would have been 2000 yeah year 2000 maybe 2001 Mm. yeah and I just applied for the first job I saw which was at a regional newspaper in Mildura and I was 21 I'd never been to Mildura Um, I didn't know anything about it Mm. 
but I'd done a bit of work experience at a couple of like country papers in the South Australian Riverland. Just I just sort of rang them up or wrote to them and said, can I do some work experience? I'd done some at Channel 7 as well. Um, and that was great. When I did it for the little newspaper in, in the Riverland, they, I got a, my name in the paper a couple of times and I remember the editor of the Sunraysia Daily in Mildura telling me in my interview, oh, that's great, we really like that paper, you know, how'd you find your work experience there? And um, I said, yeah, it was good, I had a really good time and I did this and I did this and anyway, I got the job and moved to Mildura as a 21-year-old and, yeah, I had never been there before except for the interview and I remember my older brother came up with me and spent the first couple of nights up there, told my new editor that I was a champion beer sculler, which is embarrassing, <laughs> although true. And, um, yeah, I loved it. And I always tell young journos that um, it's the best thing they could possibly do. So many young journalists want to get straight into a major metro newspaper. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. You start at the bottom and you work your way up and by the time you get there you're really prepared for the pressures of a major metro newspaper and I really loved working at a country paper and it was a daily paper and they put me straight onto crime and courts and local government I had three rounds <laughs> um, that's a common thread right for your cadet, cadet reporters or young reporters being put on the crime rounds just to see how they see how they it. go yeah, yeah I think so yeah it was certainly the case of me and before that I always sort of had this idea that maybe I'd be a sports reporter and I don't know why I thought I would enjoy such a thing <laughs> but um yeah so they put me on crime and I just rem- I had such a good time there and this, it was fascinating the stories that I got to cover and because I was you know a first year journalist as a crime and courts reporter on a daily newspaper all of a sudden I was covering quite big stories you know like murder investigations and um, drug dealers and, and that kind of thing and really that wouldn't happen at a major metro there's no way a first year journalist would get put covering a murder trial they just wouldn't Mm. And and so I had really good opportunities doing that and made some really um, good contacts and good friends. Um, the local police were amazing and I used to go down to the station most mornings and they'd make me a cup of tea and some breakfast and um, we'd sit down and talk about what happened overnight and the day and you know the crimes for the last 24 hours a briefing a briefing meeting yeah every morning with wow. the sergeants yeah that's how it was done back then wow. and so I'd hang out with the sergeants in the morning and um then they you know they all th- I think they all thought that they were my dad a little bit because they give me all these lectures if I was driving home for the weekend what do you do if a kangaroo jumps in front of the car what do you do I'm like I don't swerve they're like good okay um you know how long what time are you driving okay well that's just at sunset isn't it yes okay well you're not driving at sunset because that's really dangerous like okay i'll leave a bit later they're like how many breaks are you gonna have you know i get all those lectures all the time um and then caring lectures right yeah yeah caring lectures yeah and um the other big one was are you going to the pub on friday night like yes i am okay what are you gonna do at the end of the night i'm gonna walk into the station and um someone's going to drop me home that was their big thing like they didn't want me catching a taxi by myself not that I would have because I live walking distance from you know the CBD area Mm. but they really didn't want me walking home at night because it wasn't overly safe to do so back then in that town Mm. and um yeah so they'd call the sedan back from whatever it was doing or if it's in the station they'd just drive me home so um, to make sure I got home safely and you you were cultivating sources all the while I suppose yeah just the more you got to know each other the more they were more likely to feed you information oh yeah and by the end uh, I think by the end of my 18 months in Mildura I knew every police officer in town and um yeah so many of them I got along with really well and they always looked out for me and um yeah they're always as helpful as they could possibly be I still remember the first couple of court stories that I wrote I got one of the detectives to read them for me because I didn't do a journalism degree I did a writing degree um so no one had ever taught me how to write up a court story and there are a lot of rules associated with that to make sure that you don't impact on a on any further court action you know so 
um, no one at work had really explained it to me either. It was that that's the way it is in newspaper world. You just get thrown in. And so I remember showing them to this detective called Scott Anderson, who was the loveliest detective. Um, and he's still around somewhere in Victoria and he proofread them for me to make sure that there was no errors and that I wasn't doing anything wrong, which is just, I mean, this day it's pretty bizarre for that to happen. But yeah, in a country town, you know, 15 years ago, mm. there I was with a detective proofreading my stories. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a few steps back. Who or what were your writing interests when you were growing up? Oh, so I sub-majored at uni in children's literature. And that was always my interest um, growing up. Uh, I, used, I read a lot. Um, and, yeah, I really enjoyed that sort of young adult literature. So, like, John Marsden, love his writing. Um, you know, all the Roald Dows, all the usual ones. Um, there was other writers. Isabel Carmody was another one that girls always loved reading. She was a bit more of a, um, a sci-fi sort of fantasy writer. Mm. Um yeah, I still love reading that genre. Um, I'd like to write it someday, but you know, I, there's a big difference between writing a, a you know, true crime novel where you know how things unfold and trying to work out a plot in your own head. I'm not quite sure I'm up to it, but um, yeah, certainly that sort of genre was always um, what I really, really enjoyed reading. What about journalists? Were you interested in uh, narrative journalism or anything like that? When you, you know, I, I can't even remember why um, I wanted to be a journalist. Mm. I think it's just because I think it's more that I wanted to be a writer. Mm. And that's... There's not too many industries where you can be a writer. No. So. so I don't even think there were any um, people that I used to follow as far as, you know, writers who write that sort of narrative go. I do remember when I got my first major metro... Well, actually, sorry, it was my second. When I moved home to Adelaide... Um, so after Mildred, I worked in Melbourne for a while. And then I got a job back in Adelaide. And by then, I'd been away from home for a few years and I sort of wanted to move back home closer to my family. So I ended up working at the Sunday Mail in Adelaide. And, yeah, I still remember walking in and getting to meet, you know, Brad Crouch and David Nankervis and all of these people whose bylines I'd been seeing in the paper for years and years Mm. and and just sort of you know remembering things that they'd written um it was the same in melbourne when i used to um always love reading carly crawford's work and liam hallahan's work who were herald sun crime journos i just used to love reading their stuff um liam hallahan uh, um especially was such a, a ballsy reporter um he was just yeah some of the stuff he did you were just like that's outrageous but he yeah he was such so good at what he um at what he does mm. i hope he never listens to this um and then Why? you know I, oh because we're mates and i'd never hear the end of it <laughs> for complimenting him yeah yeah no. um yeah and then i got to work with those guys and i remember doing a shift with carly crawford who was just an amazing crime reporter in melbourne um and this is when i was working at the sunday herald sun and there had been a horrible car accident in what well, wasn't an accident. There'd been a horrible car crash in Mildura, and um, a man had run down a bunch of kids leaving a party. And I can't remember. I think it was like five or six people died. It was just horrific. And Carly had remembered that my first job was in Mildura, and she came running. We were both on the late shift together on a Saturday night. It was about 11 p.m. And she came running up to me, and I was a really junior reporter back then, and she just said, ring everyone you know in Mildura, ring them, find someone who knows what's happened. And, um, yeah, the first person I rang was my really um, good friend, um, Brennan, and he said to me straight away, my brother was there, here's his number, call him. Mm -hmm. And so within two minutes, and we were right on deadline, it was getting really late, Um, within two minutes, you know, I managed to get hold of this person who was in that crowd you know and he he'd rung his dad and um they were pulling bodies off the road and trying to help people it was really really horrific and um yeah I just remember Carly um just saying to me into the night you know you did a really good job tonight and that always yeah meant a lot coming from her and she wrote it all up and put my name on the top and you know yeah she was probably one of when I, when I was just starting out, she was someone I really looked up to. Hmm. Yeah. You were saying earlier that you never really learned how to write 
straight news stories or straight crime stories. Can you give me an overview of how in your mind that works? Like, what's the best practice? Like, what's a, a Kate um, crime story look like? Oh, so, you know, I don't... Yeah, the, I guess there's two ways of writing a crime story. And you've got your news um, piece or you've got your colour piece. So um, a news piece is very factual. You know, you have the most important fact up the top. Um, you know, it might be three people died in, in a horror night on our roads. Um, that's a news piece. It's very factual. Um, tells you what you need to know. I mostly write colour, which is very descriptive and and putting you at the scene, um, looking at it through, you know, my eyes. And, for example, um, Unji Ban was the um, young Korean girl who was murdered in the city. Um, last year? Last year. The year before, maybe? Yeah, maybe the year before. So you'd have... Um, she was working in the city. Um, she was a cleaner at a hotel. She walked home to her apartment, which is um, just on one of those big fancy buildings in the Roma Street Parklands. It's a short walk. It's like maybe 10 minutes. Um, so one way to write that is a girl was murdered as she walked home from a cleaning shift. And that would have been written. But to go alongside it, I wrote a colour piece. And so I walked from um, her hotel and walked along exactly the path she would have taken to go home until the point where she was attacked And then um, that was really about putting the reader into her mind as she was walking home that night. How, what, what it was like, the things that she would have seen, where she crossed at the lights, um, where she was when he would have grabbed when he grabbed her, and then um, yeah, that that sort of I guess how that all unfolded. And that was one of the pieces I sent through and I thought, oh, this is terrible. I'm really embarrassed to be sending this through. But it was like the next day I had, you know, so many people come up to me and saying um, that was an amazing piece of writing because really I really got the sense of what it would have been like for her or, or, you know, I really felt like I was walking in her footsteps until this horrible, horrible thing happened. And that was a really, a really horrible um, attack on a really defenceless young girl. Um, that one's still before the courts, so um, I think it was um, going through mental health court possibly, though it's sort of debating that last I heard. But yeah, so that's a colour that's a colour piece I guess. Um, and why do you prefer that? I really um, prefer writing things that way because I think you can get a bit of um, emotion into them and I don't really like writing about these horrible things that happen without putting some emotion into them so that's I I just don't I think if if you're just going to write fact after fact after fact that just doesn't do it justice to the personal element of it I mean this wasn't a 23 year old woman who was murdered this was a young girl who had moved to Australia um to have this exciting adventure and to go to uni and to make new friends and to see a new place and um, her life was just cut short for no reason, you know, like and and in a really brutal way. And I think when you're talking about crimes that are just so um, horrible and so personal, you shouldn't just reduce it to a bunch of facts. You should be able to tell people a bit more about it. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's why I like doing it. How do you go about cultivating police sources, people who will talk to you either on background or on the mm. record? Well, I suppose what's on the what's said on the record is usually pretty straightforward, especially if a crime has just occurred. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, I mean, that's really half the point of journalism is to cultivate sources. And whether they're police or, you know, in another area, I think that's all about trust and they've got to have a bit of respect for your work. So these people, if they're involved in um, in whatever it is you're writing about, they're going to read it. And if they read it and think you've presented it the right way or you've done a good job of it um, or you've helped them out in some way, um, then they're probably going to talk to you again next time. 
And if you're having a bit of a chat to someone and you say, then, look, I'm just hoping you can just help me out with a bit of background, um, and they help you out, the worst thing you can do is breach that trust. You really have to have an instinct for, you know, how much of that you will then use in your article. And you're always aware that, um, okay, this is pretty general information. I don't think that's going to impact on anything if I put it in the paper. Um, or... I definitely know I can't use that. He's just told me to help me out um, so that I'll have a better understanding of what's happened. But he hasn't told me because he's expecting it to go on the newspaper. You really have to be aware of that. Um, and they'll see that you haven't done the wrong thing by them and, you know, hopefully they'll talk to you the next time. But a lot of the time police will talk to reporters um, and give them a bit of background because having that particular information out there is going to assist their investigation. Um, so I write a lot of stories about missing persons and, um, you know, I might speak to police who are involved in that investigation and a lot of the time for them the best thing they can have in those cases is publicity. You know, did anyone see anything at this time? Did anyone hear anything? Does anyone know anything about this? You put the Crime Stoppers number in there and hopefully you can help them out a little bit and really, like, you've, they've got to have a reason to talk to you and whether that reason is they want to make sure that you get all your facts right or whether that reason is because it's going to help with, with what they're doing, then, you know, they have to have a reason to talk to you. What about the average person? Remember that example you mentioned of the the, the, the man who was at the party where um, those people had just been run over? He got his number. Why, why, why would he talk to you? What's the advantage uh, of the average person to talk to journalists? Yeah, I guess he wasn't so much the average person. He was someone that I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe but that's I, a bad example then. But. Yeah, no, no, that's all right. I can still use that as an example. Um, I, I always try and... You know, we do a lot of um, death knocking. We call it death knocking. It's a horrible word, but in journalism, I guess you call it a death knock. It's where someone's died and um, you want to speak to you know their family about that person. It's the most horrible thing a journalist ever does. No one wants to do it. Um, it's really, it's really awful to have to do it. Even you know, I've been doing them for fifteen years, and they never get easier. But I always say, and I always tell younger journalists this too: you have to give them a reason to speak to you. It's not enough to just say to them, you know, can you talk to me because I want you to talk to me because it'll make my article more interesting. That that's not good enough. You, you know that's not enough of a reason so a lot of the time um, you, you might say to them I really want to tell people a bit about this person that you've lost and what they meant to you and so many times people really want that they they want everyone to know that um, their son or their daughter or their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their husband or wife was the most amazing person in the world to them for these reasons um, they want people to see them, see what they look like, um, and they want people to understand how great that loss is. And, you know, um, to me that's usually the reason I give to people. That's, you know, all I'm doing is offering you that opportunity um, for us to write a bit of the personal side of what's happened. Um, if you don't want that, then that's fine. This is where, you know, this contact ends and, and I'll leave you alone. And a lot of the time people are really good about that. Um, A lot of the time people are grieving and the last person they want to see is a journalist. Um, But there are a lot of reasons why people might want to speak to um, a reporter. Sometimes it's just so that people know what happened, you know, because they saw it, because they were there. So they might think it's important that people know what happened from their from their perspective mm. um, but there's yeah there's a million reasons depending on the story you know maybe something's something's wrong maybe um, someone's child has drowned at a beach that should be um, that should have lifeguards there and that's why they want to talk to you because why is no one watching this beach you know this is the fourth person this year to drown at this beach and still there's no regular you know surf patrols or whatever just as an example there might be a reason why um they should talk to you so um it really just depends on the circumstances 15 years of this kind of reporting crime reporting what stands out in your mind you've done you've done countless cover stories and articles and features and color pieces about the less appealing Mm. aspects of human nature what stands out for you 
always um, the people, uh, the people that I've met, the um, incredibly strong or brave people who um, have lost someone generally. There, I mean, there was um, a murder that I covered in Adelaide um, for quite a long time where uh, a woman named Glennis Haywood would, was murdered by her husband and she was a woman who suffered years and years of domestic violence and it was a really horrific horrific case. I mean, this guy used to tie her naked to the clothesline and leave her there all day. It was just really years of abuse. And she left him, you know, um, was, you know, leaving clothes at a friend's house at this... He would let her leave the house to go to a Weight Watchers meeting once a week and that was about it. And so every time she'd go there, she'd leave some clothes with a friend. And then eventually she went to this meeting and didn't come back and went into hiding. And it was her son who lured her out um, and said, can you come around for dinner? We haven't seen you in a while. And just basically set her up to be murdered by the husband. But with stories like that, um, it was her brother who um, I spoke to initially when she went missing and um, they were trying to find her, so I interviewed him. And then I just kept speaking to him and he was a lovely, a lovely man who I think um, really felt a lot of guilt over not intervening um, or didn't know how we could have done things differently and really I don't know how we could have either um, mm. and really he he wasn't the villain there it was it was her husband so you know he he's someone who always sticks in my mind I would speak to him you know there was several months between her disappearing and, and him being arrested and I reckon I spoke to him nearly every day during that time and um, he was such a lovely person and he's someone who will always stay in my mind. Um, there's another case here, um, the lady who was murdered on Maclay Island, Lisa Lottie Watson, uh, she was in her 80s. She had a daughter named Helen and a granddaughter named Emma and that was the whole family really um, in Queensland who were yeah that was it so um, I spoke to Emma at a press conference um, Helen uh, was a bit of a recluse and didn't really ever leave the house and um, Emma her daughter um, was a chef young so only about 19 and so they had to get Emma to do the press conference. Um, does anyone know? Did anyone see anything? Um, you know, just a bit of a plea for information. And so the police officer out that way basically spoke to us first and said, we want to do this as a pool situation. So that basically means um, they have one newspaper reporter and one television reporter, and then those people would take all of their quotes um, or their recordings and hand them out to all the other media. Mm. And that puts less pressure on the person who's being asked questions. Less of an audience. Yeah. And so I spoke to Emma quite a bit first and I just sort of said, this is how it's going to work. Um, I know you've never done this before, but, you know, don't be scared. It's just us. Um, I know it's a really awful thing to talk about. Um, but uh, you don't have to answer something if you don't want to answer it. No one's going to be offended. Just And it's not live. Don't, don't forget that it's not live. So we can just pick and choose you know, what we use. So um, if you don't want to answer something, just say, can I not answer that? Or if you find yourself getting into trouble, or getting a bit upset as you're talking, um, just stop and we'll have a break and then we'll start again. So um, after that, I interviewed her a couple more times, just sort of organising it through police when they were still trying to get assistance from the public. And then, um, yeah, one day she just started following me on Twitter and then so I followed her back and then um, we started messaging each other and yeah she's such a lovely girl and not long after that we sort of just got talking all the time and um, I guess I always felt a little bit um, protective of her because she was just thrown into this world of like you know media and um, you know a person who was eventually arrested for murder and it was all so foreign to her and I just sort of thought hopefully I can sort of help her out a bit and explain to her if she came to court this is what she'd expect and um, these are the kinds of questions that TV reporters or the reporters in general might ask her if she's coming to and from court and you know that kind of thing just to make her feel a bit more comfortable with mm. it and 
then she just sort of we would just talk about all sorts of things and um yeah and then not long after that um one of the police officers involved in that case gave me a call and said um um you better get in contact with emma um helen has passed away her mother and i'd had the most amazing experience with helen who never spoke to anyone really except for her daughter um and never left the house who i wrote a couple of stories about her mother and her mother's life um and she had a really interesting life um uh yeah, so Emma would answer questions as much as she could, but she didn't know a lot about her grandmother's upbringing and her life, her young early years and all that sort of stuff. So one day my phone rang and um, this lady says to me, oh, it's, it's um, Helen Watson here. I hear you, you've been writing some stories about my mother. Mm. What do you want to know? And I had this most amazing conversation with her for about an hour where she just told me all about her mother and you know her time in the war as a nurse and those sorts of things it was incredible and I had such a good conversation with her and I think I spoke to her again after that as well um but yeah and then she she passed away in her house and um yeah Emma said to me can can you come to the funeral um yeah so I went not as a reporter but just as just as a friend yeah and um, I think the one thing I took from that funeral was that there are a lot of people who... I was really worried about Emma because she's a young girl. Her entire family, anyone, everyone she had in the world was her grandmother and, and her mother and mm. now they were both gone. So I think I was really worried about her and who would... She had a really lovely boyfriend, um, so I was always happy about that. But I thought, who is looking after this girl, you know? She's so young, who's looking after her? But I think from the funeral you could see that she had a lot of she had a big support network her mother's friends or friends of the family that sort of stuff who looked like they were going to look after her Mm. yeah so those sorts of things not so much you know the stories themselves definitely but the people you meet along the way are the things that always sort of stick with me Mm. yeah coming towards the end just a couple more questions Mm. are there certain traits that you think are required for long-term crime reporters to succeed in this oh yeah world. definitely it's not for everybody it's it can be really difficult um i think you have to be really determined and i think you have to um know i think you've got to be tough really you've got to be a bit tough because you've got to go and do some tough things and um knock on some doors in really uncomfortable situations where it's just really sad or really tragic and and it's difficult to do Um, and you've got to be able to talk to people and you've got to be able to talk to all kinds of people Um, I mean that really goes for all forms of journalism but with the crime you know you might find yourself yourself out in you know quite a rough suburb um, you know um, covering a a crime um, and you've got to be able to talk to everybody Every, everyone, you've got to be able to talk to criminals, you've got to be able to talk to victims, you've got to be able to talk to police, um, lawyers, really just the whole, the whole range. So you've got to be adaptable, you've got to be tough, and um, you have to have compassion and empathy for people, you really do, otherwise I just don't know how you can um, represent some of the things that you see and do, you know, accurately. Do you conduct yourself differently speaking to those different groups, victims, cr- criminals, police, or do you kind of try uh, to keep an even keel across a lot of them? I think you do speak to some people differently, yeah, um, depending on how well you know them as well, and um, yeah, depending on who they are, and you know, I, I think certainly I'd speak to a police officer or a lawyer differently than I would um, the family member of a murder victim, and you know I often find that I can speak to someone work-wise with a really clear head and a lot of understanding about um, I guess how I should conduct myself and approach things and say things whereas in my personal life if you know you lose a friend and you go to their funeral I'm usually pretty useless Mm. yeah completely useless I always say the wrong thing Um, but I don't generally say the wrong thing at work you know usually know how to um be respectful to people and you know usually know what to say but yeah i'm I'm just useless in my personal life is there anything you wish more people understood about your job 
Um, yeah, I think um, I think people. I wish people would understand um, how. I think journalists are often seen as vultures. I think um, as people who just go in and, and will do anything to get the story. And there are certainly journalists out there who are exactly like that. But um, it's really hard, and it's really. Um, I think to do a story justice, you sort of have to involve your emotions a little bit, you know, and I, I really hate the idea that when you're knocking on someone's door to ask them if they wanted to speak about um, someone that they've lost in tragic circumstances, uh, I think there's a lot of people out there who, who think that that requires no, no effort or no emotion at all, and that's certainly not the case. Mm. And finally, what do you do to decompress after a hard day of crime Uh, reporting? uh, I think my best outlet is my sport. I do a lot of sport and I do surf boat rowing. So I spend a lot of time out on the ocean and um, that is the best way to clear my head. Yeah, just go out for a row. Um, Go out off the back of Marichidor and row the boat around and get followed around by dolphins and, yeah, muck around with your mates in the boat and... Yeah, catch some waves. That's um, definitely my decompression. Excellent. Well, congratulations again on Publication Day. Thank you. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Penmanship, and thank you to my guest, Kate Kiriaku. I welcome your feedback, as ever, on this show. I'd love to hear who you think I should speak with. You can contact me via email, andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. The theme music you hear is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. Thanks for listening. Till next time.